Hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the New Moon webinar of the 2025 initiative. My name is Alexander and I welcome you on behalf of the 2025 initiatives coordination group. We continue our work with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals following the cycles of the new moon. And today we will focus on the goal five. And before we start today's meeting, I want to remind us that today is a very special day. This is the Master's Day in Agni Yoga tradition. And as we align today and work today, we expand our awareness of the wider esoteric communities that celebrate this special day and we join them in our hearts. Over to you, Rebecca. And so as we um, come together in that joining, we just re also remind ourselves that our meditation work through these new moon webinars, focusing on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, is one of supporting and strengthening a shared vision of formulated energy and thought forms of solution to address the issues facing humanity and the planet at this time. The intention is to vitalize thought forms and intentions that help to create conditions that will lead to the transformation of our world through the elevation of human consciousness. As Alexander shared, today is Master's Day in Agni Yoga, and we are honoring 100 years of Agni Yoga as we unite our hearts across distance through unity in service. Along with the international Agni Yoga community at this exact same moment on the planet. The Nicholas Rorick painting, Victory of Light, Fires of Timor, is being used by all of us today, symbolic of the fiery world realized throughout the etheric body of the planet and manifesting through all forms. So in our naming circle today, we will say our name and where we are calling in from. And in doing so, we offer our flame in unity through service, being aware that there are thousands around the world at this exact same moment in time offering their fiery selves in a unified field of service on behalf of the common good. This is Dot Maver calling in from New Hampshire, USA. We begin with the organizers and then attendees. Daniela. Greetings and blessings to everyone. Daniela here. I'm calling in from Egypt, Luxor. Welcome, Daniela. Martha. Good evening, and morning, afternoon, everyone. I'm calling in from Weehawken, New Jersey. Welcome, Martha. Michael. Love and blessings to everyone. This is Michael Stacy calling in from Hawaii. Welcome, Michael. Rebecca. Hello, everyone. It's Rebecca calling in from the Sunshine Coast um, on, in Queensland in Australia. Welcome, Rebecca. Alexander. Hi, and this is Alexander calling from Brooklyn in New York in the United States. Welcome, Alexander. And as we move to the attendee list, just a reminder, you may need to unmute yourself at your end. Angelica. Hello, this is Angelica. I'm calling in from London. Welcome, Angelica. 
Anne. Anne is calling in from New Jersey, USA. Welcome, Anne. Anne Marie. Hello, Anne Marie from uh, Denmark. Welcome, Anne Marie. Annette. Annette. Hello, I'm Annette calling in from the South Island, New Zealand. Welcome, Annette. Antoinette. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, Antoinette from South Africa, and blessings to everybody. Welcome, Antoinette. Antoinette? Uh, I'm sorry, Annette? You had your hand raised? Avon. Avon? United States. Welcome, Avon. Barbara. Welcome, Barbara. Cheryl. Cheryl Vinson, Ames, Iowa, United States. Welcome, Cheryl. Christine. Hello, this is Christine uh, from Sunshine Coast, Australia. Welcome, Christine. Darcy. Hello, everyone. This is Darcy from Washington, D.C., USA. Wel Welcome, Darcy. Diana. Hi, everybody. This is Diana from Caracas, Venezuela. Welcome, Diana. Jillian. Welcome, Jillian. Jeffrey. A reminder, you may need to unmute yourself. Welcome, Jeffrey. Joe. I didn't hear that. Oh, Jeffrey? Yes, uh, Jeffrey from uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota in the US. Blessings to all. Welcome, Jeffrey. Joe. Hi, everyone. This is Joe from the west coast of the United States in Oregon. Welcome, Joe. John. Hello, this is John. I'm calling in from Missouri, United States. Welcome, John. Judy. Judy, please unmute yourself. Welcome, Judy. Karen. This is Karen Gritzka calling in from Portland, Oregon. Welcome, Karen. Catherine. Kia ora, this is Catherine from Christchurch, New Zealand. Welcome, Catherine. Lerna. Hello, everyone. It's Lerna from Denmark. Welcome, Lerna. Lynn. Welcome, Lynn. Maggie. Hello, this is Mikhail from Kharkiv, Ukraine. Welcome, Mikhail. Maggie. Welcome, Maggie. Nazanin. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Nazanin from Toronto, Canada. Welcome, Nazanin. Oksana. Welcome, Oksana. Olga.
please unmute yourself. Welcome, Olga. Richard. Blessings one and all. Richard from Sunshine Coast, Australia. Welcome, Richard. Sheldon. Sheldon, please unmute. Oh, this is Sheldon from Northern California. Good to be with you. Welcome, Sheldon. Solil. Welcome, Solil. Spencer. Yes, hello. This is uh, Spencer. I'm an American calling in from Romania. Welcome, Spencer. Wendy. Please unmute. Wendy from Sydney, Australia. Welcome, Wendy. Over to you, Rebecca. Thank you, Dot. Just checking I can be heard. Yes, you can, Rebecca. Thank you. So as we continue our, our group integration and alignment um, today, we invite us all to settle into our inner being. And we see ourselves gathering together in the group circle. This ancient protective form which serves as a container for all and acts as a sign of equality with each lighted soul present in the circle being equidistant from the central point from which the life, form and substance of the circle pour out. When we bring our awareness to the fact that this is our third cycle of meditating on Sustainable Development Goal 5, Gender Equality, and that today, as we work under the influence of the sign of Aries, we are consummating the formation of a balanced triangle that resounds with the previous meditations on goal five under the signs of Libra and Gemini. And as we continue to strengthen our awareness of the group circle, we visualize within its compass an equilateral triangle, extending its points to touch the containing perimeter of the circle. So visualizing that triangle and over to you, Michael, as we continue to align. We recognize the synthesizing capacity of the triangle as a means for uniting the pairs of opposites. And we locate Libra and Aries at the two points on the base of the triangle. We contact the pulse of the opposites across the base of the triangle, Libra and Aries, with their orthodox rulers, Venus and Mars. So often used to represent the feminine and masculine aspects, both equally and fully divine. At the apex of the triangle, we locate Gemini, with its orthodox ruler, Mercury, bringing the gift of the illuminating, mediating 
mediating principle of mind and with its esoteric ruler Venus, transforming the lower mind into an instrument of intelligent love to support the pulsating love wisdom that characterizes this sign. Through these qualities of Gemini, the duality of the opposites at the base of the triangle is resolved into fluid synthesis. We begin to see the free flow of lighted energies from point to point around the triangle within the embrace of our circle as Libra and Aries, Venus and Mars, feminine and masculine come into relationship and magnetic interplay. Over to you, Martha. As the flow of energy around the triangle continues, we bring our attention to the Bindu point in the middle of the triangle, overlaying the group heart at the center of the triangle. The indwelling Christ consciousness lives in this heart point, which both sustains and is sustained by the love of the group that encircles and enfolds it. We breathe gently into the dynamic warmth and vitality of this radiant central heart. The movement of the lighted energies around the triangle come to rest in dynamic quietude of soft yet brilliant white. We come into the stillness of the silence before creation the stillness of a focused point. We become aware of ourselves working as one group under the sign of Aries, the sign of new beginnings, expressing the will to manifest soul through the medium of form. And we take up our work of receiving impressions and building the thought forms of solution together which will enable the birth of a new culture where gender equality finds natural expression through harmonious service of the whole. Over to you, Michael. Oh, in this SDG, there are six primary targets focusing on equality for women in various areas of life expression. Note that I have paraphrased the targets. Each of these targets have specific indicators to gauge progress made toward their achievement. In looking at the targets, I find it quite apparent that the goals are both important and urgent in addressing an imbalance in most cultures and human civilization. I also find it apparent that in looking at the progress and info tabs, the focus is on writing the treatment of women by men. Is there a general realization that women also treat each other disrespectfully? In addition, some of these targets could be applied to helping the situation for men. For instance, violence is not only physical, but can also be emotional, mental, and psychological. Most of these types of violence are likely not reported. To you, Rebecca. Thanks, Michael. Can we have the next slide? So um, this is um, from UN Women, just some of the stats about what is happening for, for women in intimate partner violence, which is um, a very um, focused on topic. Um, and so that you can see that um, the stats are, are very high for um, what's going on 
um, in terms of um, violence towards women or ex women experiencing violence in intimate partner partner relationships um, and that and particularly this um, second row down you can see that for um, for women it, the statistics of being a victim of homicide is a lot higher um, and um, this is not to say that with that definition of violence that Michael just brought forward that it doesn't only include physical violence um, that men and women aren't also experiencing um, a lot of violence from each other um, but but what is happening is that men are enacting this and are, are stronger and tend to be more violent um, in terms of their solution problem solving by the by the stats that we have here so so women are coming off the worse for this and um, the whole of the domestic violence movement is directed towards trying to redress this problem that is happening where women are being um, damaged and having their lives taken and being mistreated because of um, this imbalance in the, the mode of expression and the strength, the physical strength that happens. Um, then if we go to the next slide, um, we have some stats. Um, these are from the um, American Psychological Association trying to look a bit deeper under what is going on with the perpetuation of um, the domestic violence. And we come again to the idea that what we're working with here, that the thought forms are such an important part of what's going on here and they're expressed in gender role so socialization um, and so we have this strong sort of patriarchal and masculine um, stream in the way that men are socialized and that's not saying that all men are socialized that way but it's obviously ma manifesting <coughs> in our administrative systems and governance systems and in our cultural systems <coughs> where men are required to actually um, subtly through the thought form, the socialization thought forms to, to be strong, to be dominant and hence to be aggressive um, and to um, suppress emotion um, is often expected of men. Um, and when emotions are suppressed, um, and this becomes a, a um, problem and dysfunction results and um, men ex can tend to express feelings of distress through violence and anger um, is what some of the studies are showing in the third point down on this slide. Um, and the outcome of this is that in the US, men represent more than 90% of perpetrators of criminal violence and 78% of the victims as well. So um, there's this, this violent world that men are um, living in um, and um, is a problem, an underlying problem. So it's not just a case of saying, um, we stop domestic violence, but actually how do we alter the thought forms um, that are perpetuating it? And so the last point there, understanding the connection between negative male socialization, acknowledging that not all male socialization is negative, but there is a strong stream of that. Um, so this um, socialization connection with violence calls us to support preventative strat strategies that counter the problematic normative pressures that boys face. So trying to, um, you know, make a safe space for men and boys to actually express and recognizing that gender related social norms um, can be changed and that if we do that um, we can change these gendered practices and the use of violence.
When I started looking at this, I had a question that came to my mind. And the question is, what is equality? We each have certain strengths and weaknesses. Physically, emotionally, mentally, psychologically, and spiritually. We can look at each of these aspects of incarnational life, whether on a gender basis or not, and find both strengths and weaknesses in everyone. Most in this group aspire to achieve the relative perfection attained by the holy ones. Males are generally thought to have greater physical strength. But when I think about a female's tolerance to pain as being a physical strength, it is unsurpassed. As males, uh, we tend to suppress our emotions. It's societally impressed upon us, but it creates a weakness in forming meaningful relationships, among other things. Conversely, there is an inherent emotional strength of women that can become a weakness if it's not properly managed. Even if we are able to adequately adequately answer this question about equality, there's another question. How can or should equality be measured? And this can be just as difficult. The indicators are a solution arrived at by the framers of the SDGs, but do those show how hearts and minds are being adjusted to show the love and respect that should be afforded to everyone? It is time that we learn to follow the law of love, which is the overall law of our universe. When we do so, we treat all manifestation with equity and respect. For we know that all is indeed one, then all human laws will simply be expressions of this one law. Yeah, so is that over to me now? Um, yes. Thank you, Michael. So we just have um, taken the triangle within the circle to look at, at um, how this might happen um, and recognising that to change hearts and minds, we need um, impulses and initiatives that come from community but we also need lawmakers and organisations to uphold um, equality and prioritise the importance of meaningful human relationships. And so the apex of the triangle there expresses the will to good, um, and that is the uniting point for community and lawmakers to come together. Um, then in the centre of the triangle, we have consilience, um, which um, can be defined as the linking together of principles from different disciplines and different areas um, to form a comprehensive whole. Um, and on the next slide, um, we just have a couple of examples of community and law. <laughs> um, on the right um, is from a local paper in the area where I live where there's been um, an initiative by um, three combined service clubs locally to partner around domestic violence and the priority here is um, about developing relationship and about men and women coming together to talk about solving this problem and finding ways that um, the whole community can work <coughs> to, to solve this problem. So really recognising, <coughs> excuse me, at a community level that this is a relational problem. Excuse me. <coughs> On the left, um, we have Convention 190. Oh, could you just go back for a sec? Oh yeah, thank you. Convention 190. And Martha, would you say a few words about this? In uh, Convention 190 is actually a resolution that was um, approved within an agency called the International Labor Organization. 
And often in your agencies in the UN system, you will find uh, normative shifts taking place ahead of um, general resolution, general assembly resolutions and uh, governmental um, uh, focal points. This is significant because this resolution links verbal abuse, harassment. There have been enough psychological studies to indicate that not only when women are physically abused, but when they're intimidated or um, uh, constricted by the negative gender roles in both genders, the um, tendency is the to constrain uh, future uh, advancement, um, uh, future forms of expression, and they've learned to quantify uh, some of these challenges in ways that demonstrate that it hurts the corporation when there's a permissive tone toward these kinds of things. So we, um, it represents the way cultures can advance in their understanding as to what norms are expected. So wanted to use this as an example of a normative shift that ties together certain elements that have been compartmentalized before. Verbal abuse was not considered um, ab abuse. Um, harassment was not taken seriously enough to um, become uh, reprehensible or uh, 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 something that uh, needed to be regulated. So we're watching the refinement of how we think in an effort to um, restore the, some of our assumptions toward our better selves. Um, that term consilience, which is the which is, as we said, combines disciplines from various fields, it came to mind because we um, are learning that when we take a certain approach toward one gender, it impacts the other and vice versa. So the underlying, the, the, the essence of the issue with empowering women is to restore a balance to all humanity and that it can take place through these regulations or conventions through the uh, shifting of infrastructure which we'll talk about in the next slide and also this notion of allowing the good to dominate which is really what is essential to what it is to be humane. Back to you. No, to me. <laughs> <laughs> when we talk about community, it truly is the fact that when we think about it, the local community often generates the most creative impulses that then um, can permeate larger um, understandings and even to normative shifts in the entire culture. And this is a, an illustration of something that many of you I know know about called appreciative inquiry. Um, originally, it was designed by a David Cooper writer, business professor at Case Western Reserve. Um, who was working on the problem of why morale was very low in certain companies and what could be done to restore it. And that what he was basically after was finding a methodology that would promote more engagement. And that just being able to buy stock in a company didn't actually um, achieve the intended effect for that. So he came up with this system that has been elaborated by other experts and applied to different major organizations such as United Religions Initiative to um, create 
permeable, flexible, interconnected approaches uh, called uh, definition, discovery, dream, design, destiny, and deliver, delivery, which was, as, was in, as impactful on the local level as it could be on an international level. So when this model was applied in a grassroots way, where each um, circle in uh, United Religions Initiative could adopt this model, um, it started in 2000. There were actually no grassroots organizations uh, formally a part of it, but right away, um, before too long, over a hundred small groups came together in various countries and even to uh, different continents. And within 20 years, the organization found using this model that it now has over a million members who um, have very flexible, pragmatic structures, no ideology um, other than the uh, determination to find cooperation as uh, the dominant uh, value that would be operational in every sphere of decision-making, delivery, design uh, of its systems. So that when we talk about empowering any group, and in this case, women, we want to understand this tripartite notion of First of all, knowing that where we are going is to promote the will to good, consciousness elevation. And that when we talk about community, it's a very defined and disciplined, uh, purposeful um, expression of qualified leadership that enables community to emerge into something that is in fact able to um, implement uh, regulations that have normative values. So you, you can't have one without the other. When we look at these models, we note that the issue of gender equality is a, is a no-brainer. Because why wouldn't you want to have in your organization based in cooperation, why wouldn't you want to have the fullest expression of the best of the male with the best of the female? Um, and thus um, actually reinvigorate a principle, philosophic principle that goes back to Hermes. So I think that pretty much takes care of it. So on to the next slide. Well, thank you very much. Um, you know, when, when we think about gender, it generates something of a sense of separateness. Uh, and what is separateness? The Tibetan calls it a great heresy, a product of the unillumined human mind, the one real sin. Some terms used include hatred, aloneness, and division. It is desire oriented towards selfishness exclusiveness and pride. Our personality reactions are misused and misapplied. It's called the last veil of illusion. It expresses as hatred, active dislike or voiced criticism and sometimes all three. However, this loss of identifying as the one life is a necessary quality for unfolding self-consciousness and it occurs on the involutionary path. For humanity, a sense of uniqueness is the subtle seed of this great heresy. This goal focuses specifically on the female gender, especially those 15 years of age and older. The divine feminine seems to have been lost in a male dominated or patriarchal environment. But in returning the feminine to its rightful place, we must be careful in how far the pendulum swings. We must not lose sight that the masculine and feminine 
each have different but important roles in divine expression. When the distorted ideal becomes the dogma of the idol, a great awakening, oftentimes very painful, must occur. As we approach the Aquarian age and with humanity crossing the burning ground, the turmoil and chaos indicate that adjustments are occurring in the outer world today, and those adjustments are absolutely necessary. Rebecca? So we have another triangle um, of um, masculine, feminine, and the right relationship that brings people together. Um, and then at the center, the Bindu point of love. And you know what we are really talking about is with establishing harmonious gender relationships is the work of being able to come into and express love. Um, so yeah, DK has um, some words to say on that. Um, and I found in Esoteric Psychology Volume 1, um, where he speaks about the symbol of sex, where you also have the reality of love expressing its, itself um, with love in reality, connoting a relation, a relation and um, um, expressing the law of attraction. Um, so yeah, if you want to um, read more about that, um, Esoteric Psychology, Volume 1, from page 277 forward um, to 286, um, and then 288, uh, it, um, you can find more about that. But um, the essence of the, the relationship between male and female and the coming together is love in, um, you know, bringing to birth um, the creative um, manifestation of the divine. So as we create a new thought form, we want to make sure that we are addressing causes and not treating effects. The indicators show achievement of the target goals are very much based on gauging effects. What percentage of this or that has been achieved? What countries have passed appropriate laws in conformance with the SDG? And are there and are then enforcing those laws? Unfortunately, laws have often unintended consequences. If laws mandating equality instead unintentionally or perhaps intentionally create inequality, what might be the consequences? Are underlying causes being addressed, such as a lack of respect for others and of each of us taking responsibility for our own thoughts, words, and actions? If we just look at these two causes, respect and responsibility, we can find the need for both the divine masculine and the divine feminine in each. This brings in the importance of education especially regarding the law of rebirth and the law of karma, or as preferred by the Tibetan, the law of karma is the law of opportunity. As we create and build this newer thought form of consilience and equity, we must keep in mind that the sacred nature of all life must be part of the equation. Martha? First of all, I do want to thank uh, Darcy Sessions for um, a, a wonderful article. And if you can, Darcy, to just put it in the chat box, uh, this geometry of energy dot weebly dot com, whereby the um, discussion of the male female uh, counterpoints are. Uh, identified within uh, one unity and uh, actually 
one of the things that those of us who work as occultists know that for, for proper occult work to take place within the form that each of us is given, we recognize the uh, as a as a woman the masculine in myself and in as as men the femininity in themselves and the um, freedom that comes to men when the negative stereotypes no longer become normative in culture, and when the um, extremely externalized stereotypes uh, within the feminine form are also released, the uh, empowerment and strength of the uh, feminine influence is felt. So that there's a, a free flow, creativity, receptivity, Pro projection, reception, uh, take place in, in more of what we opened with, with the circle, though one would recognize you lift it up from the center, it becomes a spiral. So thank you, uh, Darcy, for this beautiful uh, expression, and hopefully in the Q&A you can say a little bit more about that. I think it's back to you, Rebecca, um, in terms of moving us on. So we now come to the meditation time um, where we'll um, let all these stimulus, stimuli of the discussion sink into our unconscious um, as we open consciously to the higher to receive some impressions and over to you Martha to begin leading that with us. So let us now release the material that we have passed through, we take it inside our hearts, the heart and the head, that internalizes what is true for us in our own service. And let us visualize our group centers as we take a unified breath and align ourselves within the group field. And we extend our group light to illuminate and express the loving heart of Gaia that is ever present in the one life. Let us recognize how the sustainable development goals offer opportunity for humanity to pass through the gate of the first initiation. And I invite my co-collaborators to offer their intentions, Rebecca. Let the new group of world servers draw together in consciousness and will to receive and support the manifestation of humanity's next evolutionary steps. Let there be sacred equity in gender polarity, expressing as spirit and matter, form and substance transforming duality into harmony. Let humanity's behavior of activity and receptivity bring balance in serenity. Let us make note of those in field of exoteric humanitarian service, those hierarchical beings who are also moving onto higher planes in their company to all of humanity in cooperation with those servers here and on the other side, with whom humanity will take more responsibility for the sacralization of planet Earth. For those most impacted by the coronavirus, for those healthcare workers who are working most closely with them, for those who have the capacity to provide what is needed and would be willing to leave their expected uh, productions and way of operating to creatively produce those 
uh, products that promote our better understanding of the physical impacts of coronavirus. Thank you, Michael. For all workers in the various fields of science, pursuing proof of the existence of the soul, showing the continuity of life beyond the veil of death, and hence the reality of the laws of karma and rebirth, and especially all those involved in restoring balance between all kingdoms of nature. Rebecca. And we call upon the etheric forces and invite them, invoke them into healing service of humanity at this time in service of the plan. We hold these thought forms in the group mind as we focus now our attention on goal five. Achieve gender equity and empower all women and girls. And as we enter the power of silence together, let us hear it in the one note of abiding love that brings us all in the company of the one soul. Let the universal law of love prevail. In silence, let the soul of humanity disseminate. As we register our impressions, we see goal five expressing through the ever emerging presence of Gaia who brings consilience, receptivity, creativity. As we realize the livingness of no one left behind, where men and women may find enhanced realization via this goal. As together, we build our resilience all over the world. Now, we anchor the thought form and distribute the energy gathered as we sound the mantra, let the forces of light bring illumination to all mankind, humankind. Let the spirit of peace be spread abroad. May all those of goodwill everywhere meet in a spirit of cooperation. May forgiveness on the part of all of us be the keynote at this time. Let power attend the efforts of the great ones. So let it be and help us to do our part. We invite you now <clears throat> to say the great invocation. The first stanza will be led by Michael, the next Rebecca, Martha will lead the third, back to Michael, and the final with Rebecca. This is the 1935 um, stanza of the great invocation. Let the forces of light bring illumination to humankind. From the point of light within the mind of God, let light stream forth into human minds. Let light descend on earth. From the point of love within the heart of God, let love stream forth into the hearts of mankind. Let Christ return to earth. 
and from the center where the will of God is known. Let purpose guide the little wills of men, the purpose which the masters know and serve. From the center which we call the human race, let the plan of love and light work out and may it seal the door where evil dwells. May the three of us say the final sentence. Let, Let light, light and, and love, love and, and power, power restore, restore the, the plan, the plan on, on earth. earth. Oh. And so we just take a moment to collect ourselves. <laughs> mm. As we yes. draw together yeah. and open the opportunity for discussion. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Martha, Rebecca, Michael. Let us take one minute of silence together as we fully register the depth and breadth of what is coming through the group. And as we gently return to our circle, 
in unity with co-workers around the world. Let us give voice and share with one another any thoughts, impressions, comments. If you will kindly raise your hand if you wish to share. Thank you. Sheldon, let me just unmute. Okay. Yes. Okay, so I just wanted to thank, thank you all for this marvelous, um, creative and, and uh, powerful presentation and say that um, it strikes on all levels. And at the same time, just the word gender equality for me evokes the feeling of a huge open heartedness, the heart of the Christ. Mm. Mm. So I wanted to um, thank you back, uh, Sheldon, in speaking for the group, but to share uh, with you that at a meeting this morning on Zoom um, with the Finance for Development Commission, who's inviting uh, policy statements from uh, the NGO community to um, recognize that the coronavirus uh, impact is expected to have an enormous impact economically that uh, our speaker, Navid Damim, who's head of the uh, interagency task force, said that that from um, appearances that the uh, expectation is that the consequences of the virus economically should be somewhat similar to what happened in um, the Great Depression. And that it, that the United States is uh, expected to um, become the very quickly the epicenter. So it was somewhat appropriate that during our meditation, we heard the um, ambulance sirens outside the window um, as they are now seemingly in the habit of doing 10 times a day to remind us that maybe what we um, assumed was the way um, a uh, successful life might appear is really an illusion, but that the real opportunity is this opportunity for us to love one another better. And um, in the immediate surroundings where we are, and that in the community where I live, it uh, is not um, a progressive community uh, in itself. 
it's a wonderful school system and it's a beautiful location. It um, swings back and forth between uh, Republican and Democrat. But the real conversation is more about how does what does authoritarian what does an authoritarian system look like versus a system whereby everybody takes responsibility and demonstrates respect and it's not that we have answers but i can see the beginnings of the shifting of discourse from it's this or it's that or it's this person or it's that person and that uh, this is a time for listening. It's a time for supporting um, many who are unready or were unable to have a cushion. So the, the thought of being able to come together in this extraordinary time of new moon on the day of the masters is a, is a really um, wonderful opportunity. Uh, I do want to thank the New Moon organizers for their consistency and persistence in making these things happen. Thank you. Haven. We're wondering if you would be willing to share a few thoughts in this moment. You would need to unmute yourself. Mm. Alexander, I see there might be an, an issue there. So, even if you want to send something, happy to read it. Yeah, Avon uh, is muted on his side, so probably there's some, something mm. happening with the, mic, with the technology. For those who are following the chat box also, there are numerous resources, thank you, Leslie, uh, listed there, and uh, some really heartfelt comments. Uh, and the word that comes to mind is synthesis. And as we all come together uh, in this moment in time, we're reminded that synthesis is unity, must be created. And together, all of us and with all of our colleagues and co-workers uh, around the world, we are indeed creating unity and building and realizing a unified field of conscious service. So gratitude, Rebecca, Michael, and Martha for demonstrating that beautifully in this webinar. Thank you, Dot. And, um... Yeah, thanks to everyone and Michael and Martha for coming together to to be here and do this and everyone that's present. Um, I just wanted to bring out some of the points that Leslie's, um, or just bring out her comments so that she's provided some materials um, which are predominantly educational and as Martha noted, um, the importance of education in, in developing new thought forms that are going to be more harmonious for future relationships. So um, the, there's violence in the media, there's articles on violence in the media and media linked 
toys increasing, parents and teachers are also seeing an increase in children's war play. And um, the authors of one of these resources have uh, revised their text to provide more practical guidance for working with children to promote creative play, positively influencing lessons about violence that children are learning. <clears throat> um, developmental and socio-political viewpoints, um, examining strategies for resolving um, the war play dilemma. Um, so yeah, there's a there's a lot of um, resources here that are just looking about um, children's experience of the world through play and um, through these conflictual models of play that have been set up. And also in relation to the coronavirus, um, something that has struck me as we've been thinking and trying to process the experience um, as well as um, just the idea of immunity. Um, so we've um, had articulated the idea that it's a time to reach for something new, an opportunity to reevaluate old models. Um, but I think this idea of immunity, it's an opportunity to recognise the distinction between the self and the not self. Um, and so the higher values and, and the uh, materialistic values, um, and that's what immunity actually is. <laughs> and so in the situation, the challenge is to um, recognize the true self amidst the sort of um, fear that's being generated and the sense of the need for self-preservation that's being generated and to recognize the values of the true self in um, aligning with the evolutionary opportunities, contextualizing the hardship in, in a higher light and um, recognising the oneness of us all so that we're not just buying toilet paper for us. <laughs> so yeah, some thoughts around that. Mm. Ah, thank you, Rebecca. Chris, we see that your hand is up if you'll unmute yourself. Thanks, Dot. <clears throat> and thanks, Rebecca, Michael, and Martha for uh, leading this webinar. Just having a couple of thoughts, um, and I think this this topic is always a really difficult one um, for uh, people to speak to. And I really appreciated the um, the material around separation and, and thinking about um, the very discussion around a, a gender inequality actually can um, set up the very thing that we're trying to avoid. But I particularly wanted to talk about not just the resources, the wonderful resources that Leslie shared, um, not just thinking about um, you know educating um, children and young people around around their play, but actually genuinely supporting children and young people to develop the social and emotional skills to be able to deal with conflict as it arises in relationships in healthy and constructive ways and providing opportunities for children and young people to develop the qualities of empathy and compassion. And I think as we have moved to an education system that is curriculum focused, we've shifted away from educating um, children and young people on these really vitally important skills. And I know there are a lot of amazing teachers out there that really attempt to build this um, content into their um, classroom routines and that is really really wonderful and thank goodness for those teachers um, but I just wanted to recognize that as we kind of focus on curriculum and not on 
these qualities that we're trying to build into our relationships, we really need to supplement opportunities for children and young people to be able to learn the skills to live in right relationship. And of course, that then will lead to generational change. So just kind of wanted to offer that as a thought. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chris. If you have a recommendation for uh, a resource for the social emotional piece that you mentioned, please uh, put it in the chat box. Spencer. Uh, yes, hi. Um, I do appreciate the webinar, and I would like to make a couple comments, though about some things that uh, I've kind of come up with over the years that maybe some people could um, either reply to me or just think about. Uh, to me, I found three male roles um, that are operating on the planet. The first one is the one that I think everybody's talking about today, and that's what I would call um, more the physical one, the male that's in a, in a male body responding to um, personality, which is more third ray. And then there's a female male that's responding more to the male soul in her. And then there's a higher male that's actually responding to the monadic impulses that are coming through now directly to humanity. And I didn't hear anybody making those differentiations, but I'd like to put them out there maybe for people to consider. That to me, we're looking at three male roles and the female counterparts to those three male roles. Well, that's maybe enough for right now. Thank you. I think it's a very interesting perspective. Thank you, Spencer, for sharing that. And if we think uh, that archetypically uh, spirit is uh, is a male uh, quality and matter the earth is the has the female quality and so that if we think about that in terms of equality so this it's in a way it's a spirit of our time bringing the spirit and matter in equilibrium Okay. And we know that the keynote of the seventh ray is the higher and the lower meet, and spirit radiates the form. So that's in a way, if we think about that in that context, so the gender equality really becomes a zeitgeist, like the spirit of our time. Um, just to, so you know, I couldn't understand. What did you say is the zeitgeist? Or could you explain that more, what you mean by what? I understand the word zeitgeist. I just don't understand what you referred to as the zeitgeist. The uh, quality of the seventh ray, uh, that's we, we know that with the new age, the seven rays influence is uh, coming into power uh, superseding the sixth ray and the key note one of the key notes of the seventh ray is that the the higher and the lower meet and the spirit irradiates the form and so that's uh the higher the spirit the male aspect and the lower the form the female aspect come into the equilibrium so in a way we create the antakarana bridge between the high and the lower and that's what is the soul manifestation is and so that's what i refer as the zeitgeist moment creating that equilibrium between the two pairs of opposites as a manifestation of the spirit which is soul manifestation of spirit in form
Does it make sense? Um, yes, in, in that way of looking at it. However, I believe I'm looking at it in a very different way, the same things. And that again is that the higher male, what I'm calling the monadic one and the personality one, the form one is still male because he's in a male body. So therefore he's not the female form in the example I'm giving and the analogy I'm using or the hypothesis I'm presenting. And therefore the female who's aligned with her soul is the third male. And it's all three of those that are balancing. So I understand what you're saying, but I feel there's something that I'm saying beyond that, that that still doesn't explain with these three males and how the female counterparts to those work. All of those are going on, all those balancing between higher and lower, between the higher male, the female soul incarnated and the lower male. So you're taking one out of them that to me is already something I wouldn't consider because that female form is really a male soul. At least that's the way I'm trying to consider it or present it to the group. Um, so therefore, I'm not saying you're wrong or your analogy isn't right, but I feel I'm presenting a different analogy to that whole concept. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Spencer. It's uh, food for thought. And uh, if, if you have something that you've written on that or you have some place for us to take that further, if we're interested beyond the webinar, please put it in the chat box. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I will I actually do have a paper on that and I'll put it uh, a link to it on the on the chat. Wonderful. Box. Wonderful. Deep appreciation. So I see there's also a comment from Gillian saying um, um, abuse can result from male-female relationships being based on something other than love. I'm not sure, uh, Darcy shared the link, uh, if it's the link to the paper that um, was referred to. Yes, mm -hmm. that, would, yes. that would be the link to the paper that Martha referred to at the beginning of the meditation. Yes, it is at weebly.com. Thank you, Darcy. So as we come to a close, let's take just a moment of silence together and then Alexander, will you offer our, our next uh, SDG and then we'll close.
Thank you. In the new cycle of uh, Aries tourists, we invite the group to reflect and meditate on the uh, goal for education for all. So on the new moon of Taurus, we'll come together to share and meditate, strengthening the thought forms related to the education. And on April 7th, at the full moon of Aries, we invite you to join the webinar opening the new year program with Antonella Nobilio and Philip Lindsay, who will take us into reflection on the keynotes of areas as those relate to the seeding of the ideas and living as the incarnated soul. Thank you. Over to you, Doug. Mm, thank you, Alexander. From Agni Yoga, when the planet loses its equilibrium, owing to the loss of spiritual understanding, the consequences to the planet are inevitable, for there is no karmic effect without cause, and no cause without effect. The manifestation called forth by the loss of spiritual strivings will certainly induce those impulses which will bring regeneration to the planet. The appearance of physical changes will give to the planet the understanding of Agni Yoga. The financial crash will affect a revaluation of values. The distortion of religions will result in a search for a new spiritual achievement. Therefore, verily, the crumbling of the old world is a new affirmation. For through the coming of new values, we bring to the world the salvation of spirit. May the spirit of peace be spread abroad in our hearts, through our groups, and throughout the world.